Hello again, Deacon Dana here. And today we're recording the third of my Bible study updates, a few thoughts offered in the hope that they might help us as we make our way through this pandemic together. And let's begin once more with a prayer. Come Holy Spirit, fill us with your gifts of knowledge and wisdom, strengthen us with your heavenly grace so that we may grasp with our minds, treasure in our hearts and carry out in our lives all the teachings of your holy book and your holy church that lead to salvation. Amen. Today's talk is a little different, perhaps more personal, and certainly more down to earth. So consumed are we by this COVID-19 virus, this, this microscopic molecule that defines so much of our lives today, I thought it would be good to kind of step away from it if only for a while, and turn our attention to another more benign of God's creatures. You know, the universe is filled with wondrous objects. I I studied astronomy and astrophysics undergraduate, and, you know, we see our universe filled with everything from interstellar dust to clusters of galaxies. But God's greatest creative act was life itself. As revealed in Genesis, at the pinnacle of God's creation, is man. Let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle according to their kinds, and every living thing that creeps upon the ground according to its kind. But before he created sea life and birds and the beasts of the earth, before he created man and woman, on the third day God created a very different kind of life a life form without which the rest of his living creation could not exist. He created the plants and the trees. Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees trees bringing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind upon the earth. It was no accident then that man and women were first placed in a garden. There they were nourished by the fruit of the garden's many trees, and there too they ate the fruit of the one tree forbidden to them. And out of the ground the Lord God made grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We won't dwell on that first original sin here today, except to affirm that it wasn't the fault of the tree. Indeed, as non-sentient creatures, trees are inherently faultless. You know, it's kind of hard to dislike trees. They live such long and elevated lives, and they seem to project an air of quiet stateliness, don't they? You know, if you've ever read any of J.R.R. Tolkien's books, you will know he had a special fondness for trees. Of course, there are his Ents the wise, rootless tree herders who come to the aid of civilization as it fights the forces of destruction. But I've always thought the outcry of the hobbit Sam Gamgee in the concluding series of Tolkien's trilogy, right in the very end of the the third volume, mirrored the author's own sorrow over the sacrificial destruction of trees by modern man. They've cut it down, cried Sam. They've cut down the party tree. He pointed to where the tree had stood, under which Bilbo had made his farewell speech. It was lying lopped and dead in the field. As if this were the last straw, Sam burst into tears. Yeah, yeah, trees offer us a sign of hope. Their very presence seems to restrain the powers of desolation. You know, deserts and other empty places, treeless places, have never attracted me. I can imagine no more unpleasant place than the Sahara Desert or the appropriately named Death Valley. In the books of Exodus and Numbers, God leads leads the Israelites uh, into the desert. The wilderness that they went into was no Eden, but rather a place of trial that, that tested their faith and readied them for the entrance into the Promised Land. Jesus, too, in preparation for his public ministry and all that will follow, was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, a place of desolation 
where he encountered the temptations of Satan, one senses that the evil one is quite at home in such places. You know, I too was led into the desert, but by the United States Navy. As a young pilot about to join a squadron destined for service in the Vietnam conflict, I was required to complete a course of survival, evasion, resistance, and escape to prepare me for the possibility of capture by our nation's enemies. Conducted in Southern California's high desert, it taught me many useful and excellent survival skills. It also reaffirmed my determination to avoid capture and my dislike of deserts. But deserts are not the only desolate, treeless places. Consider, for example, the island nation of Iceland. You know, I've been to Iceland only twice, both just brief stopovers. On my first visit in the summer of 1965, our U.S. Navy transport plane landed at what was then Keflavik Naval Air Station to refuel. We had only a few hours on the ground, but that was long enough to convince me that Iceland was a barren, forbidding looking place. I wasn't sure why exactly until we took off and I could view the landscape from above. That's when it hit me. I saw no trees. Indeed, most of the surface, surface was hardened lava and craggy rock, all craggy and stark and seemingly lifeless. As a 21-year-old, I had never met an Icelander, so I wondered what kind of people would call this desolate island home. I assumed these descendants of the Vikings were hardy, practical folks who probably considered themselves slightly superior to the rest of humanity. Today, 55 years later, I've still never met an Icelander, at least not up close and personal, so my prejudice remains. But in the summer of 2012, I visited the island once again, this time in the company of Diane. This visit too was brief and it was spent entirely in the terminal. The first leg of our Iceland flight took us from Orlando to Keflavik, now a major civilian airport. After a 90 minute wait, we changed planes for our flight to our final destination, Gatwick's airport in London. As we took off only moments after sunrise, Diane, who had been looking out the window, turned to me and said, you know what? I simply replied, yes, there are no trees. She laughed and said, that's exactly what I was going to say. Actually, Iceland is not completely devoid of trees, but according to friends who have spent more than a few hours there, you have to look for them. Apparently, there's an old Icelandic saying, one that's become a common line fed to tourists. In Iceland, if you see threes to, three trees together, you're in a forest. In truth, there are a couple of actual forests, although the trees there tend to be stunted. For example, birch trees that rarely exceed 15 feet. For me, it's all very sad, and I could never live in such a place, a place where trees are rare. I suppose I've always enjoyed the presence of these, these creatures of God, these most magnificent of God's rooted creatures. When I was a boy, I climbed many trees, especially one of the Japanese maples in our suburban New York front yard. I often stretched out comfortably on its branches, oh, for an hour or so, to avoid life's distractions, or to read a book, or just to observe the goings on in our quiet neighborhood. Our front yard was also home to a large weeping willow, another target of opportunity for my climbing skills. Sadly, my parents were forced to remove that tree because of its thirsty roots that broke into our home's water pipes. And, and what can be more inviting to a 10-year-old boy than a trail leading into a forest? My friends and I would occasionally bicycle several miles to a local woodland called Saxon Woods and spend the day playing imaginative games there amidst the trees. Years later, when we lived on Cape Cod, I would take our children to visit a tree we called the greatest tree in the world, a European weeping beech. Its branches form a magnificent canopy, stretching haphazardly in all directions. It's an incredibly special tree, and were it permitted, would be a marvelously climbing tree, too. But aware of its age and fragility, we simply sit in its shade, surrounded by its presence. Let me assure you, though, I'm not a tree hugger and never experienced the urge to embrace any of those perfectly formed 
climbing trees. Even as a child, I realized that trees, while certainly living creatures, lacked awareness of their own existence or of mine. I mean, people are free to hug trees if they like, even talk to them. But to expect a response, well, that's nothing but a cry for help. As a wise Baptist farmer once said to me, don't talk to the garden, talk with the gardener. Trees created by God, the cosmic gardener, deserve our attention, if not our hugs, both for their beauty and their utility. You know, their utility can be intentional, like the sawed boards I used to turn into bookcases, or accidental, like the dead beach recalled by the poet Wendell Berry. The great hollow trunk beach, a landmark I love to return to, its leaves gold lit on the silver branches in the fall, blown down after a hundred years of standing, a footbridge over a stream. Its beauty destroyed by death, the beach continues to serve other creatures as a footbridge. In sacred scripture too, we find trees blessed for their utility. Indeed, the tree becomes a key element of hospitality during a divine visit to the patriarch Abraham and his wife Sarah. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oak of Mamre as he sat in the entrance of his tent while the day was growing hot. Looking up, he saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them and bowing to the ground, he said, Sir, if you please, do not go on past your servant. Let some water be to be brought that you may bathe your feet and then rest under the tree. In Isaiah, we encounter the tree's utility, both for good and evil purposes. Of the idolatrous woodcutter, Isaiah writes, he goes out to cut down cedars, takes a home tree or an oak. He picks out for himself trees of the forest, plants a fir, and the rain makes it grow. It is used for fuel. With some of the wood, he warms himself, makes a fire and bakes bread. Half of it he, turns in the, he burns in the fire. On its embers he roasts meat. He eats the roast and is full. He warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I see the flames. The rest of it he makes into a god, an image to worship and adore. He prays to it and says, Help me, you are my god. They do not know. They do not understand. Their eyes are too clouded to see. Their minds to perceive. Scripture also offers us symbolic trees as metaphors of something greater. In Psalm 1, the Messiah is prefigured. He is like a tree planted near springs of water that yield its fruit in season. Its leaves never wither. Whatever he does prospers. And in one of the briefest of Psalms, it uses the olive tree to describe the family of the righteous man. Your wife will be like the fruitful vine within your home, your children like young olive plants around the table. Just so will the man be blessed who fears the Lord. There are dozens, probably hundreds, of other Old Testament references to trees, far too many to include here. But let me refer you to, a chapter, four, to chapter 4 of the book of Jonah, in which God uses a tree to teach his reluctant prophet a lesson in humility and a, and a lesson in the love of God. We won't read it here, it's too long, but it's worth a read for you. Jesus referred frequently to, his, to trees in his teaching. For example, when he, de, when he described the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his, in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs, and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Jesus called on the tree too when teaching the apostles of their role in the church. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit because without me you can do nothing. And perhaps most fittingly and most gloriously, Jesus was nailed to the dead remnant of a tree. He died on that tree 
raised up for all to see, making it the universal symbol, symbol of our Christian faith. We celebrate that tree, that holy cross, every time we bless ourselves and others with its sign. We honor the tiniest pieces of that tree, protecting them in reliquaries spread throughout the world. The cross is, in a very real sense, the tree of life, the tree of eternal life. As Christians, indeed, as human beings, we should praise and thank God for the goodness of his creation. Take a moment to turn to chapter 3 of the book of the prophet Daniel and read the beautiful prayer of blessing by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they stood in the fiery furnace in the presence of God. It is a prayer echoed by all creation. Just see it, Daniel 3, verses 51 to 90. Again, it's worth a read. This is all a good lesson for us today as we huddle in our homes, separated from others, wondering when it will all end. But even now, we can walk through our neighborhoods and we can see God's creative goodness spread all around us, savor it, breathe it in deeply, and then thank God for it. God love you.